get this out of the way. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to get some stuff similar to stuff poking out. I think this armadillo model, you can get it maybe on the Stanford scanning website, or it's one of the free models that's available most places. Um, this is a good thing just to test stuff out with or whatever. But yeah, I just wanted to start with scrap from scratch for this one. Um, and we can get started. Let's see what we got on the re weather report here. Got any more? <laughs> Been getting a lot of rain, a lot of rain these days. Vinny Nation, good to see you. So yeah, we'll just get started with the geo. Um, maybe. I don't know, these platonics sometimes are nice to start out with. Um, I'm going to get into the dark viewport. Yeah, SSS might be a little bit wonky with particles. Um, sometimes it depends on the p-scale stuff. I think, I don't know, I haven't done it recently, but in the past with Redshift, um, I ended up doing instancing spheres onto the points and that was giving me like a better result than doing the checkbox that says renders particle system. Um, so I would try that out as well maybe and just see if that gives you better results too. So yeah, maybe this one's cool. I'm just gonna move it. above the uh, origin. You guys are enjoying nice weather in Germany? What area are you in? <laughs> I've been looking to uh, maybe go to Berlin or something sometime. So this is above the origin and then I'm just gonna rotate it as well. Um, on the x axis here so that it's kind of close to like lying flat or whatever. I don't know why it doesn't start out that way, but it's um, nice to have it flat. <laughs> if you're really um, OCD <laughs> like I am sometimes, you can go into the wireframe thing and then go from like the um, orthographic views and really get in with the precision and there, there we go we know it's mostly uh, straight now like a gem like a diamond or something like that okay <laughs> block in IRL stream doing Houdini Okay, so maybe the sweep or I don't know, maybe even the VDB stuff is a better way to bring all these things into um, like better joints. Sometimes you can do the polypath stuff, but Not always ideal, um, but I think just for a somewhat good topology or something like that, let's uh, maybe we'll, let's actually just, you can do end caps here. And then it would kind of do like spheres or rounded uh, things. Um, maybe we could even switch these to Square two. Maybe that could be cool. We'll just give it a try. So we just have some kind of 
interesting structure or shape or something like that. And then we can just kind of make it like a back into a polygonal thing. I actually saw that there was a lab stool, I think, for this that was like, maybe it was one of the instant mesh meshers or something like that. Or maybe it was a new um, new thing they did, but somewhere, I don't know, I remember, <laughs> they, they added too much stuff. But yeah, somewhere they have something that gives you like a DVB mesh of a, of a character or something. I don't remember what it is. All right, so I'm just going to go back to the round. Remesh to grid. That sounds like it's. Yeah, so I think this is basically doing this similar steps that I'm doing here. So you just set your voxel size and it gives you a nice thing like that. You have some nice options as well for like there's blurs and stuff like that built in. So it's similar thing, but I don't know. Some of it's nice to know about or use those, the pre-builds. All right, pretty cool. We'll just start out a little bit lower. And then if we do this VOP here, um, you could take the position like this, and this is almost like some of the Material X stuff I was doing in recent streams, where I was getting like object space position or doing um, some mathematical functions and stuff with that uh, data or with that the coordinates and everything. So if we maybe just multiply this, this is like a higher frequency for your pattern or texture. And then you get the length of the sine function. Um, you can kind of keep stacking this another time or so. And you'll start to get interesting patterns. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Just funny circles and stuff like that. Um, if you want to see it a little bit more clearly, you can try it out on a grid. So it gives you this kind of repetitive uh, rings or something like that. That's a pretty cool pattern. So maybe I'll just keep this over here on the side so you check it out if you want before I go in here and make more of a mess. So we can use this similar to like we were doing a shader, um, but just on the actual geometry. Ding, ding, ding. So you're starting to get some weird funny shapes. You can play around with these um, frequencies for the pattern and get interesting results for sure. Now it almost looks like a simulation or like some kind of fungi or I don't know. So I'm just more of a natural organic shape for sure. Um, so we have this. Sometimes if you do the smooth, this is also available in the Material X stuff. But it's like a, a smooth step function. It looks like this is clamping the values. Uh, maybe we can do that. Yeah, 
All right, we'll do this absolute. Yeah, that's a pretty cool one. Um, you can definitely do a ton of nice procedural textures and stuff with it. Um, like if you just mix uh, color mix, this can be your controls. And this one, you probably want the smooth. Um, and you want this to be the amount. And then negative one. So if you're making a shader um, and you want just some two-tone colors or something like that, you can do this and get some pretty quick results. You might want to do the bias and gain stuff as well on this and you can more easily control like the falloffs. But I think people definitely do this type of stuff and you can even mix different materials like this might be a gold or metal um, detail. And then the other thing could just be like regular paint or plastic. So it's really useful for shaders, um, patterns, or yeah, even just crazy stuff like that. So we have this absolute value and we can also get the sign. So, <laughs> Not this sign, but mathematical, like positive or negative um, sign. Uh, and then if you just multiply the result here, you're kind of reapplying the sign, um, like the posit positivity or negativity of the number. Um, so this is one way you can still do the smooth operation, but um, keep the negative numbers as well. So it's a little bit <clears throat> nicer. You, I don't know, I think you get a little less artifacts or whatever. It's just, if you look at the actual logo for it, it like avoids getting sharp edges or um, kind of artifacts or things like that for sure. All right, so this is a pretty interesting shape. Um, you could just save this where we are. What do we have here? 13. Just call this the blobby boy, like that. And if you want to get up to date, play around with this, you should see the scene file pop up in the chat. And I'm gonna keep going with it for a little bit. Um, we could maybe just set up a little bit more of a uh, scene just in case, in case other people are opening the thing and want a chance to get caught up shade mvm yep have a good class thanks for for stopping by so at the very end i'm just going to do another match size here and we'll disable the other orientations then we'll just have it so it's sitting on the uh grid and maybe instead of a grid, let's uh, divert this into a quick kind of pedestal. Whoa, grab the wrong one there. So this will just be our little plinth or something. Something like that. We'll grab the primitive selection from there. Oof. Then we can lower it down. So I don't think we want all of those 
how this seems. Let's actually, if we invert this group pretty quickly. Oof. So I think it's just primitive number four. I was just looking at the one that wasn't, the one that they skipped in that selection. Um, so yeah, I can just go up by five and then just transform everything down like that. Watching Integma's last tutorial yesterday and they played with Karma XPU. I wondered that Material X Karma doesn't have stuff like native Fresnel shaders, the hacky Fresnel setup. Yeah, I think that they, I don't know, I've seen some people hack around it. They have the thin film interface or whatever that will give you like facing ratio or whatever. Um, so they might have that kind of stuff. Oh dear. What have I done? Um, but yeah, I was starting to think of some, try, try to think of some ways to do that stuff. Um, Cause I think if you have the spacing ratio, you should be able to get kind of a Fresnel, um, set up out of it. Basically, this is your, your um, one of these has to be your view vector, like the incident vector, and then the other one would be the surface normal. Uh, oh, okay, they use that. Um, yeah, and then the, I don't know, the other thing is that in shaders or stuff like that, um, I mean, you can look at maths for Fresnel and like facing ratio gets you pretty close, but face, all that face, facing ratio is is like the dot product of those vectors. So you can do that as well if you really want to mess around with it. Um, but yeah, I think like the standard surface um, Somewhere they, they have some stuff, I'm pretty sure, that's like this thin film thickness. I think this will automatically give you color ramps and stuff like that as well if you're trying to do like a um, metallic metal or iridescent uh, surfaces or stuff like that. But yeah, we'll get back here. Um, we'll make maybe a camera. Something like this should be nice. And I'll just do a quick test render here. Maybe just make my make sure my Redshift is uh, working with these new new plugins that they uh, put out. It looks like it's working. It's a good sign. Maybe just start with an environment. Got to get the right one for Redshift. I'm usually using these Material X supplied HDRs um, just so you don't have to worry too much about keeping all this stuff relative. Uh, yeah, I might try Karma XPU a little bit later on. Um, 
but yeah, I just wanted to see what was going on. So the Redshift 1 is supposed to be pretty cool. I haven't tried the, I don't know if the XBU supports random walk or that stuff, but we can uh, probably get through both of them and see what's going on. So yeah, just on the standard um, material, that's like the new uh, surface model that they released um, somewhat recently, like in the past month or so. And they have this new interface for the shader. Um, this video, okay, it's not, let me know if this starts dropping too many frames. My GPUs are working too hard. Um, but yeah, they have this new subsurface. You can turn it up and the random walk is enabled by default. And then this is the like per color or spectral radius, I guess. It's not really spectral color space, but Per RGB channel, you can do your own radius, or you can scale the radius down here. Um, so this, I think, should be kind of like object space for the same units of your model. Um, so there's definitely a little bit of work you might have to do to find good numbers, but you can get, I would, I would say, much better. Um, performance of those blobby areas that I was talking about earlier, doing that kind of stuff. And then by default, if you have it at one here, it will like take priority over the diffuse. So whatever you have there, it would just ignore it. Um, sometimes I'll just turn this off or to zero, but either way, it's, it's basically um, ignoring the diffuse in that case. You can see maybe with some of this color attenuation stuff, um, you can get pretty interesting subsurface effects and, and materials and stuff like that that's pretty interesting as well. So you have something like a skin. <laughs> It's like an Eric Ferguson creation. <laughs> Familiar with their work. It's very, very uh, subsurface, fleshy, heavy. I think some, some of it is like violating the terms of service to <laughs> show too much of it on, on Twitch. So yeah, if you get closer to red, you'll really get some, some interesting blobby stuff. Um, sometimes I add the coat as well on top of everything. Let me just see what's going on here. I guess this HDRI is just a little bit funky, but basically that you can use that as like an extra layer of uh, reflection and stuff. So it can be nice to kind of add that in like that. Depending on what you're trying to make or if you want it to feel wet or something like that, you can use this coat for some interesting effects like that. All right, so I'm just gonna leave this maybe something closer to defaults. Um, and then we can get back into the stop stuff in a little bit. All right. 
This is like a uh, shampoo, <laughs> some skin lotion commercial or something like that. And then I think on this plinth, uh, we definitely want these normals. So it looks like the ones that um, Redshift was getting before were like a little bit scuffed. All right. So if we're going to get these even more distorted or like interesting, um, I'm just going to branch off here and one thing we can do that's pretty cool is if you do for loop that just keeps feeding back on itself um, you can do these deformations or um, displacements kind of recursively or like iteratively so if I turn down the overall amount there, um, it's basically, it would like keep updating the normal or the direction that it's pushing it. So you can get, instead of just like one linear push, you can get more complex kind of uh, structures and stuff like that for sure. Um, you can see maybe at some points it's like starting to get a little bit gnarly. Um, usually if I'm doing this iterative stuff, you can put in a little blur and sometimes that will help you in, in those areas. And then because this is doing a, a blur or a smooth each like feedback operation, you might want to turn down the overall amount a little bit. And then another thing that you can do, um, so we can just kind of walk through like one iteration maybe. We'll reset the cache. So if we capture this <clears throat> pre-distorted position, get the updated uh, deformation and probably the, maybe just right here, um, we can use this detangle. Oof, <laughs> no we can't. All right, yes, yes we can. So it's just looking for this previous position. So in this case, it's just the rest. And we can turn down, uh, that's like the surface thickness or like collision uh, padding basically. Um, so if you add this step inside of everything, you should start to get better uh, resolution, like um, kind of resolves the penetrations and, and stuff like that much better. I don't know, but I don't know, maybe pushing it in. These areas are going to get too scrunched up. Juan, how's it going? You know where to get free <laughs> shader ball? Um, there's a few, depending on which... <laughs> which one you're you're interested in um there was actually one in the material x uh resources that come with houdini that i was using um if you if you're in houdini and you just put down a file node you can do dollar sign hh slash material x and then if you <clears throat> look around in that directory, they have some extra resources. And then in geometry, they have this shader ball, OBJ. Um, 
and this comes with pretty good, this is like a pretty standard one. Um, comes with a good UV uh, layout and stuff like that. Um, if you press the nine key over the viewport as well, you can see the different groups. So I think that this calibration mesh, they're usually assigning like a gray color to it. Um, they also have some stuff in the images, like this gray sphere calibration uh, belongs to the calibration mesh. Let's get out of this group selection. Um, Maybe it got. The UVs got messed up or something. It should work with that. Maybe they're in their example, they're transforming the UVs around it. You could maybe, maybe line it up better, but um, I think that their intention is that this color ring goes there as like a calibration measurement or whatever. Um, so that's one. And then side effects has this one that they ship with as well, but if you're testing with other renders and stuff, like I think this Material X one is better because it's like more of a standardized thing. Um, and then on there, Website as well, Material X has like a web GL uh, shader viewer that you can, in the web browser, you can play around with values and, and do some interesting stuff like that. So down here this time, I just got rid of um, the negative values inside. That's what I was doing with this smooth. Um, Let me try a different thing though. So maybe See, so see if this, this number here is less than zero, it's a negative number. Um, so in that case, we want it to maybe multiply or scale it down by like 0 0.2. Otherwise, we'll use a value of one. And then this way, we should basically just be reducing um, the inward direction of that stuff. So let's take a look here and see if this gives us a different Should be a little bit different. Uh, I think I was messing this up a little bit. So we want to use both of these. Um, multiplications should be working uh, 
I don't know, sometimes you have to re uh, update that stuff. But unless I've done something wrong. This is why I'm not a big fan of doing too much stuff in Vops, because some of these conditional statements and stuff get a little bit weird when you're representing them with like node. Uh, you're representing this stuff with nodes and it's not always the most clear way to visualize what's going on. So it looks like this is just applying it to everything or something, but let's just get rid of that for right now. I'm just going to go back to using this smooth. And let's just do this. So there's an easier way to see what's going on. So we have incoming numbers between negative one and one, and we'll just kind of shift them. Um, said that the negative numbers there should just be 25% of what they were. That's probably a better way to see what's going on. So we have this growing shape now. Um, we could play around with these pattern frequencies as well. Maybe we want a higher frequency if we want to see more um, little smaller like shapes or features. Something like that. We can take a look. So basically the subsurface will tend to work better when you have just surface detail or, or kind of features like that, that that poke out a little bit. So it's pretty cool that you can see these like more accurate um, darkening and brightening of those areas. But I think if we go up a little bit um, higher in resolution, we might be able to even glean a little bit more detail or stuff out of this. Oof. <laughs> Oof, it's getting real, uh, real wild now. Maybe you want to do a sub, sub D layer. Um, before rendering it. Ooh, it's starting to look pretty gnarly. All right, let's get some other uh, shader stuff going on here and see. So this. Some, yeah, it's some kind of squid or, I don't know, <laughs> jellyfish or something like that. Heterize, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. And, uh, we can increase that scale. I'm just going to get rid of this for right now. Um, so yeah, we could try the larger scale. Some kind of <laughs> muscles or barnacles or something like that for sure. Um, but yeah, I think so basically previously they were doing like the, the ray traced or point based caching and you can see just those results it's just a lot kind of blurrier or doesn't do a good job of like accurately kind of capturing things it's very I don't know 
just feels a little bit more fake. But the whole idea with this random walk stuff is basically um, to be more accurate or, or realistic, I would say. So we can go maybe something like 0.4 is pretty good. Do you have any tips on where to learn Houdini? Been using Intagma a bunch and other resources. More focused on VEX and simulation stuff, trying to really understand. Uh, yeah, it's pretty beginner language stuff, but there's been this series that's like the secret language of Houdini. But that's basically um, along those lines, I think, like just goes more in depth of like the structure and design of the software, if that makes sense. Um, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's like a series that this guy, Robert McGee has been doing. Um, yeah, so he's been doing it different times. And then I think as well, there's like a foundations or fundamentals or something um, area on the forums um, that there's like a PDF or something that goes with it that might be interesting. Um, but yeah, just in terms of like understanding, I mean, during those talks and the presentations, it's a pretty good uh, explanation of what's going on. But I think overall, it just depends um, on your learning style. Some people, so I guess this foundation series is like maybe meant to do that. Um, along the similar, I mean, just getting familiar with the UI and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I can't seem to find this PDF, but somewhere there is a good thing. Um, this is a really old one, but Houdini on the spot. Um, there's like a book, but I was using this um, when I was like learning Houdini. I mean, it's pretty outdated. <laughs> in terms of UI and stuff like that, but in terms of, uh, I don't know how to zoom that in. Um, in terms of really understanding like the structure of uh, nodes and this kind of stuff, I mean, it's a pretty good manual, it's kind of like a, Good replacement to the manual or something like that I would say um, it even goes into really advanced like expression formatting and I don't know I, I always found that pretty helpful um, but yeah some of those things might be good I don't know if this PDF thing was like Houdini so I think this one has been getting updated over time, uh, but this is a free <clears throat> one that SideFX has been putting out as well that is a good uh, resource to have for sure. So there might be newer versions of it if you search around. Um, but as well, I mean, this is pretty good. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Presentation of information is a little bit more digestible than just looking through the, the docs or stuff like that. All right, so we could, uh, I'm just gonna keep messing around with this shape a little bit more. Switching to Karma at some point. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been using it. I used it last stream. 
Um, I, I think in general, I just have to wait and see if it gets out of the beta phase or, I mean, it, it's missing a lot of features with XPU right now and then uh, too slow for me to use just on the CPU. So just, it's hard to, hard to completely switch to a non-feature complete <laughs> renderer at this moment, but uh, hopefully they'll, they'll keep improving, improving it. So we're going to get rid of these artifacts. I think we could increase the smoothing now that um, we've up the mesh. Like basically this smoothing is somewhat dependent on uh, edge length or topology. So get a little better results that way. And we might also just want to try it overall boost is like double more than double the <laughs> displacement steps so it should get a lot um, bigger should grow a lot more we have some interesting shape uh, I might reduce this first frequency but we're getting some interesting uh, little guys peeking out at us from inside of it or something like that. Good morning. Good to see you, Mosoe. Thank you. It's a little weird uh, sea, sea creatures, <laughs> some kind of weird fleshy thing. But yeah, I'm trying out the new Redshift uh, subsurface model, uh, the random walk shading model. Were you ever able to find um, any more material presets for Redshift? Yes, I think the values should carry over a little bit. Um, I'm actually just going to pop in another light here. So let's just toss a grid rectangle light. Get back into the camera here. Houdini effects. <laughs> Thank you for the tier one. Yes, yeah, Saul, Saul is a really talented um, with Redshift. He also, as well, has some OSL repository stuff that's pretty cool, like presets or something close to what you could call presets for um, the OSL mechanism of Redshift. I'm just putting this light above everything. And uh, definitely helps you like see a lot more of what's going on. I think our radius is a little bit too big now. Oof. I think these colors are just too uh, wild. I think just getting too too much into the saturation stuff, and you'll get some weird funky colors. Yeah, we were looking at the XK Studio a couple streams ago. 
Um, but yeah, the, all their work is amazing. They're, uh, I think there were some side effects, their uh, SIGGRAPH talks they did as well that, that should be pretty helpful. Yeah, all their like soft body um, simulation stuff is amazing. So this is a little bit more of what I was looking for with that coat layer. Um, but yeah, I'll just keep going. Yeah, I think the off, it might have not even have been like off Barcelona, the most recent one, but it might have been from like two years ago. I found that one pretty, pretty helpful, pretty insightful. All right. Let's just maybe make this a new version. You guys want the link? You should see it pop up. And uh, I'm just gonna try <clears throat> some something else here. So I'm gonna reduce the resolution. of the mesh. Just to work more interactively for a moment. And then I think if we take like a curl noise, I usually add this um, as a vector for, oof, not that one. Uh, vector to vector for just so if I want to add a time offset or something later it's the UI is already like pre-built for it and then I'm going to use this to basically like distort the surface position before we um, run the sine waves and stuff through it So let's see what happens. So we should get some more irregular, uh, kind of like warping that structure so it's not as um, grid-like or, or repetitive. So this should help us get a little bit more organic. I might leave the Y a little bit uh, scrunched. And then maybe this frequency as well, we try lowering it. I don't know, sometimes you can even go pretty high. We'll just maybe stay with that. And then I think of this final remapping you could let some larger negative values come through hopefully <clears throat> you can scoop more like folds that are going in a little bit zach good to see you so having those negative values I'm trying to get just more caves or grooves <laughs> then we'll work our way back up to the higher resolution so this maybe makes some areas of it feel a little bit more natural Sometimes if you reduce the weight of the collision, um, you're kind of doing, you're not fully resolving the collisions, you're just like smoothing it a little bit. Uh, sometimes you can like preserve some detail and stuff that way. Let's go. So 
So I don't know, we might need to <laughs> put that back if we wanted to fix that last issue. But we should be able to take another look here. We're starting to get something kind of funny. So I'm just trying it without the uh, environment light on. Sometimes if you're messing around with shaders, you can just tell what's going on a little bit better if you're not adding like a outdoor light or scene or whatever to everything. those um, colors are kind of doing as much as they can but sometimes if you just add some just to the initial like tint or color you can get uh, pretty far that way as well the same result of material in Karma XPU. Possibly, I, I'm not sure if the um, random walk subsurface, I mean this random walk thing is kind of uh, open source information or like someone wrote like a paper about it basically. But because the XPU stuff is still in, in beta, um, you might need to look through these limitations or something like that and uh, see if it's supporting um, subsurface or that kind of stuff on the GPU. I don't remember 100% if it was supporting it or not, or even if they have that as part of Material X. Graphic in motion. Good to see you. Ooh. Some kind of citrus. <laughs> Citrusy fruit or something like that now. But yeah, I think that this, the random walk definitely gives you the best kind of interaction of surfaces and um, curvature and, and all that stuff and like how it plays together or whatever. I don't know, I might be getting too colorful over here. Let's take a look at this. Nang, Nang Nine, <laughs> thank you for the tier one. Sorry about that pronunciation. Yeah, I think that this looks similar subsurface stuff for sure. I think with um, liquids, this subsurface thing would be interesting to try with um, milk, orange juice, we kind of have an orange juice thing happening here. Um, but yeah, I think it could be interesting. Greetings, 
Hello in Thailand. Yeah, I mean, you could use this as a base for flip. I think you could also as well do some stuff with vellum. Um, I don't have time to mess with it today, but basically this is all the same topology, same point count. So you could use it as like a guide um, edge length and have vellum kind of grow or morph into this or animate into it or something like that. Um, you can as well like animate these layers being put on and you can get uh, some motion or like animation that way as well. Yeah, the vellum stuff would be pretty cool for sure. So I think this first frequency might be too high. Maybe this one as well. Yeah, these, these things as well you could offset with time. Um, Sometimes if you do too much with the detangle, like you'll get between frames, you'll get flickering and stuff like that. But it's it's definitely worth a try. I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying some other shapes here. Let's see see what's going on. I think that <clears throat> first one we had was good enough. But yeah, you also have this fourth component that I was putting in there that could be animated with um, time as well, like to evolve um, the curl noise that we're kind of pushing everything around with. So I'm gonna add, we were do just doing 10 iterations initially, but I'm going to try even more. We should get some really gnarly stuff. Oof. Look at all of that. It's almost like a mushroom, something like that. Do you animate one iteration per frame? Yeah, you can do one iteration per frame if you put dollar $f in there. And then if you do time blend uh, beneath it, maybe at the end we could try this. Um, this will interpolate between iterations. And then if you do another time shift and do like 10% of the speed, then you'll get a gradual growth or something like that. So this is blending between iterations. And then this is just um, slowing down. And then usually this usually want to subtract one and then add one at the end so that it still starts at frame one. But yeah, we can try that later. See, see how this SSS <laughs> got it, some mold, <laughs> some kind of fungus or something like that uh, growing here now. 
All right, so I think. I'm going to try a couple more things, just tweaking these patterns and stuff. Um, so I think this one here might have gotten a little bit too high of a frequency. Virus. Yeah, I think for microscopic, microscopic uh, things for sure, um, microbes and... <laughs> That kind of stuff, they they lean into the subsurface shading quite a bit as well. All right, what do we, what do we have here? I think this frequency right here got too low. So now we're back to something like the barnacles, the urch sea urchins or something like that. I'm trying to find <clears throat> kind of like a middle ground or something like that. So I think something like this could end up looking interesting. We'll try just cranking the values, <laughs> cranking the iterations and see what happens. Look at that juicy, juicy. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. It looks like it could be the inside of a fruit or something like that. <laughs> All right, let me, uh, I'm just going to play around with this a little bit more. I think overall these patterns and stuff might have just gotten a little bit too high frequency. Like, I don't know, I think overall I want to see more just spatial like variation or whatever in everything.
All right, so crank up the mesh detail. This is definitely, yeah, it's a <laughs> brains or like esophagus or <laughs> some kind of entrails or something like that. Pretty wacky. Tyrone, how's it going? All right, so I think we could be getting close to wrapping things up. I'm just gonna put in some other lights. This one could be like <clears throat> a rim, something like that. Let's go into the first, first light. Yeah, I think this version is um, like just having more variation in the structure, being less uniform or whatever. It's pretty cool. Kind of weird to have like two lights in the same place, but it's giving some interesting results. I think that, uh, environment is a little bit too <laughs> too weird with the plinth to have it outside like that showing off more of those little wrinkles and stuff like that. Let's get a material on the flint. So if you want some nice edges and don't want to be doing it in the actual geometry, you can just do the round corners and that will give you a little bit more realistic uh, edges. I think these lights might need to be bigger. These are, I don't know, these shadows are feeling a little bit too uh, crisp.
Yeah, we can play around with some of the depth of field and macro or something. Um, there's definitely some stuff you can do, maybe even in the shader, that could be interesting. All right, I think that's mostly okay for the... <clears throat> uh, just a two-point lighting, like I'm kind of just relying on the SSS and the uh, bounce, like GI for fill. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know, let's call this kind of the rim. Like, that's the rim, maybe. <laughs> I mean, that's not a proper three-point lighting setup, but um, this is kind of the key. And then I'm just letting the SSS do its thing for fill lighting or whatever. Try this and see what happens. So, if we want even more detail, like close in, we can see what happens with this bump. I think let's try. Um, let's maybe do. Do this. So we keep updating the rest each iteration, but then we can grab um, the initial um, rest, like undistorted. So that should give us stretched like the, the noise should conform to some of those wrinkles and stuff like that a little bit. I think Redshift might just automatically use the rest So let's <clears throat> try um, to find something a little more gnarly, like organic. I think this one could be cool. So you can try to get some of the fine detail or something out of it. Oof. I don't know. <laughs> I think this cranal one is a good one. For better, uh, similar to that last one, but it's better, like, balanced. 
Um, so yeah, if we just grab this screen, we go back into the blobby and disable that. You can see it, it was using, it just automatically uses the rest. So this is, the noise is bulging with it when we toss this original position to use as a texture space. Um, otherwise, if you re just do another world space or like object space noise, you don't get the nice like distortions. That was something that took me a long time to figure out with Redshift is that it just automatically picks it up. The bump map, um, you just do height. I think you do height to normal. And the bump is your height. Um, so I think in the last... Uh, summary. I had a little chart. Height to normal and then normal map and then put that in. So whatever texture map or wherever your bump source is, if you just plug it in there, um, you'll be bump. I mean, uh, th that is the same idea. Like normal mapping and bump mapping are similar techniques for in terms of the shader. Oof, look at all that gnarly bits. Yeah, it's, it's nice that the subsurface seems to be interacting with the um, bump map, even though it's not like true displacement, which is pretty cool. Um, you might want to play around with this. I think we can get better um, wrinkles and stuff like that. I'm flipping it around, inverting it or whatever. Then we'll try to just get these white Parts a little bit more isolated. Oh dear. <laughs> it's definitely feeling more gnarly now. some magical flakes. Yeah, I was thinking about adding another noise, some stuff in that could be interesting. Um, I think I know what you're talking about here, but something like this definitely helps. Um, so I was thinking about doing something with something else with this shader as well. So if we get another noise. Maybe the, <clears throat> these worthy. The, 
some of these ones I think work better for it. You can get, uh, I don't know about those. Diamonds. Maybe the dents will work best. But basically you just smash it. So you basically get little chips or something like that. Um, and then I'm gonna switch this range around. Kind of. Kind of too repetitive there. Might just try a different uh, pattern. So this is a little bit more irregular, maybe. No worries, thanks for stopping by, Graphic in Motion. So I think those little things... Um, let me see if this works. I think that's another way to flip the range around. Like, basically, it does the same operation as this. Um, but yeah, I think we want to multiply the bump strength by this, so that it the wrinkles don't carry on through these areas, and then. Um, We can try blending. So this is our subsurface, will be our base material. Hopefully. We'll make another shader for those like chips or flakes or something like that that won't have any subsurface let's just start with like red maybe blue will be easier just to make sure it's working so you should be able to see those details it's pretty subtle but I think it should be nice Maybe uh, maybe we can do something with a ramp. I think we want these to be more metallic. So increase that IOR. So let's grab another noise. This one will just be very subtle. So we'll make it a lot bigger, smoother. And then I think we can use this through the ramp.
to get some interesting color palette or something. Maybe the infrared is good. But we just want to increase this. Try to see more of the color values or whatever. I don't know, they, they don't really just have like a multiplier or something. It's maybe a little bit frustrating. I'm just gonna go back and do the change range. So this way we can see when we're kind of hitting that, the highest value, the lowest value. And then maybe we want some <clears throat> other uh, colors. I don't know, this is maybe a little bit too, too wild. Something like that could be interesting. So this is going to be the like color of those flakes, with the little chips or whatever. We should be able to make them a little bit bigger, maybe. If we play with those numbers. So just some variations of color between all that stuff. All right, I'm just gonna do the post stuff. <clears throat> um, depth of field, of course. Why not? Always. I feel like even if you're not really going wild with it, it's Nice to have. I don't think this one's going to be too out of focus, but just having some stuff like that pretty subtle is, is nice. I'm actually going to move that light back a little bit. Yeah, this is the Asus in the... Um, I don't think my color palettes like are color corrected when I'm picking, but I just ignore that and just like go by uh, what I see in the final output usually. That corner lit up, but like that was a little distracting for me. So I think this a little bit better of a composition. I'm 
usually I mess around with these color controls a little bit. If they let me. So I, for whatever reason, it's really hard to get the little... Um, there, there you go. So, <clears throat> it's, I mean, it's usually pretty subtle, but I feel like doing a little bit of a kind of S-curve. Gives you just a little bit more like contrast or something. Maybe just really subtle bloom. Maybe that plinth is better. I don't know. I think that's feeling better. All right, I think you can just try going HD. Whoops. 2K. This I don't. It's kind of. 3K or something like that. Maybe with the camera, we want to punch it in. Bing, bing, bing. Kind of like zooms in or something like that. And I think we'll see what happens. Look at all that extra detail. Some kind of mystical ancient uh, dinosaurs like coming out of an egg, maybe. <laughs> Some kind of Ridley Scott alien creature or something. Is this view stuttering? I guess I, I think I just, I guess it's still using the two GPUs, but it's not too bad. But yeah, I think that these glints or flakes, kind of like what, what you had in mind, Panders, like I, I think that kind of stuff definitely helps the bump noise that you can see there, pretty good. All of that stuff like interacts with this random walk subsurface model. So that's really cool. Then this is just some fake iridescence or um, what I was doing with that noise in the color ramp. If you just want some variation, some basic like spatial uh, variation of colors and stuff like that definitely helps. I think I'm done with this, this shading, but to go further, you can maybe manipulate the specular based off of these wrinkles or throw in more noises to distort anisotropy or something like that. Um, could be cool to play around with. 
but I, I'm running out of time. <laughs> We've birthed one creature. I think somehow it's floating up above a little bit. But yeah, that's pretty cool. And then to have this, if you're just doing images, if you bake, if you want to bake this ACES stuff in, um, if you just dump it either to JPEG or ping, um, it will usually, it will apply the same look and everything. So we'll just do this as number two. And these are the ones um, we were looking at. So this is from right now. And then this is one I was uh, testing. Just basic getting a sense for the settings. Like didn't do any of the detailed stuff in the shader, but I think this random walk stuff is definitely really powerful. So maybe this uh, 